All right. So I'm here with Nathan Robinson, who is an English American journalist, political commentator and editor in chief of the left wing progressive current affairs magazine, which he founded in 2015. So, Nathan, welcome to the show. And I appreciate you coming on. Hey, Eric, it's good to be with you. Now, I think you just finished up your PhD at Harvard a couple years ago, right? In social. Yeah, policy. 20. Yeah, 2022. A couple of years ago now. Great. Great. What was your dissertation on? I'm officially Dr. Dr. Robinson. Dr. Robinson. So my remarks all carry more scholarly weight now. Yeah. <laughs> um, my dissertation was actually on the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, okay. And and, nice. and the resurgence of socialist organizing in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I studied, my PhD was in social policy and sociology, and I... I um, in sociology, there's this kind of famous uh, the, 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 this famous tr tradition of inquiry onto why the United States has no so why is there no socialism in the United States? Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was a book by that title in the early 1900s, and uh, and so mine was kind of like why why now why has why is there socialism in the in the United States? How did it how did it bounce back? Um, right. So I was kind of exploring that question. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, too, I should note Nathan is, um, you know, the author hey, of the book. two really tremendous books right here. Responding to the Right, Brief Replies to 25 Conservative Arguments. Highly recommend you guys check this one out. And then, of course, Why You Should Be a Socialist. Hey, you got this is a good one here. And you've um, written other books, too, of course. Are you? Yeah, there are a few of them now. There are a few yeah, of them now. Yeah. Are you working there's on any? One Trump. There's one on Bill Clinton. I'm just finishing up... Uh... We're just sending to press, actually, a uh, book on American foreign policy uh, that I've co-written with Noam Chomsky um, called, yeah, The Myth of American Idealism. That's going to be coming out in October from Penguin Random House. Wow, great. Looking forward to reading it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's my favorite of the books that I've done so oh, far. Yeah? It's really, I've worked harder on this than on anything else I've ever worked on. So oh, that's great, man. I'm, I'm really pretty, to pretty it. excited about it. All right. Well, let's get right into the uh, discussion here. So sure. I, I know I've heard you say before, you don't like when people ask, give a definition of socialism. I know it's. Yeah. So that's how hard. we're going to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know it's pretty it, it can be difficult to give that kind of, um, you know, that kind of definition. But in an elevator pitch, what is socialism? Yeah, well. OK, so one of the reasons I don't like to do that is because socialists yeah. themselves, people who call themselves socialists have had different definitions of what that of that what that means to them mm -hmm. and it's the same way that if you ask you know what is love what is democracy you know <laughs> right. these kind of abstractions that a lot of people talk about but mm -hmm. that have kind of uh, fuzzy meanings but it, with love and democracy as with love and democracy you can you can kind of zero in on some some commonalities right so where I usually start with socialism is, well, okay, if you look at the history of socialism, what have, what have, what have people been talking about? And mm -hmm. they've been usually animated by an opposition to a class system. That is to say, they have looked at situations of extreme inequality where there is an owning class and there is a working class. And there is, so there are the people who sell their labor, and then there are the people who own the company. And there are the people who, who are you know rich and powerful, and then there are the rest of us who do all the work. And right. they have objected to that, and they have pushed for a vastly more equal society built on the basis of principles of uh, solidarity and usually some kind of collective ownership. Now, it should be, it's often mistakenly asserted that socialism is government ownership yeah. of the economy or the means of production. And I want to make clear that that is an erroneous definition of socialism. And we know that it's an erroneous definition because you could I could point it out very quickly, which is if you had a situation, imagine a situation in which you had a king and the king was the government and the king owned the whole economy. Mm -hmm. Well, you would have in that absolute monarchy, a situation of, quote, government ownership of the means of production. But you clearly wouldn't have anything that a socialist would call socialism, because mm -hmm. it would be one guy who owns everything. And right. so it can't be that mere government ownership suffices. The form of government has to matter. And so what socialists usually talk about is collective ownership or 
economic democracy. That is to say, they want to get away from those kinds of situations in which one person or a small number of people owns and controls pretty much everything. And that's why a lot of socialists say that countries like the USSR, which claimed to be socialist, weren't actually socialist because they replicated that situation in which a small number of elites is making the decisions for everyone else and there isn't meaningful democracy in in the workplace so <laughs> where i start with socialism is these principles of solidarity uh you know eugene debs the great american socialist said you know while there's a lower class i am in it while there's a soul in prison i am not free that is to <laughs> say looking at the people at the bottom and fighting for them and that belief that there should be a uh, a flattening where you shouldn't have a small class of owners and a large class of workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are different forms of socialism too, kind of like you were alluding to, uh, Marxism, anarchism, Fabianism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of socialists in the tradition that are anarchists who actually loathe the government. That's right. That's yeah, right. right, right. So um, and I like what you said too about the form of government matters. It can't just yeah. come down to government control. That cannot be the definition of socialism. Yeah. Yeah. So flowing from that, how would you frame capitalism? Someone were to ask you, what the hell is well, capitalism? Well, I, I would start like I did with the previous one with clearing yeah. up what it isn't, because mm -hmm. with socialism, we can clear up that it isn't mere government ownership. And with capitalism, there's often a conflation of capitalism and markets. That is to say, um, the use of money and prices and situations in which you know you uh you are selling your wares in the farmer's market and i'm coming and giving you you know some dollars and you're giving me a sack of potatoes or whatever <laughs> um that's not what socialists mean when they refer to capitalism again what they're referring to usually is a combination of a market system and a class system that is to say what we've already discussed, which is a situation of, you know, Marxism, the, the analysis always begins with class. It always mm -hmm. begins mm -hmm. with there are some people who have this function in the economy that is to own and control. And there are some people who don't have any ownership over anything. Um, they rent their houses. Uh, they rent, they sell their labor and they, they just have very little ownerships. And so they're yeah. at the mercy of those people who they depend on for their living. And that's mm -hmm. crucial to capitalism because there are market socialists, which if you think that socialists oppose the market or believe in abolishing money, which I, I, you know, some, some have talked about having non-monetary systems for everything, but um, other socialists have said, well, hang on a minute, we can change the ownership structure without getting rid of markets that is to mm -hmm. say uh you could have you could have people buying and selling things but you wouldn't have a vast amount of inequality um you would have you know companies would be owned by their workers or mm -hmm. uh a, or you know large corporations would be owned by the state which would itself be democratic which would mean um things like i mean you have like uh versions of this in you know alaska where there's like the collective uh, uh oil proceeds fund mm -hmm. right where they they you know the people of alaska get benefits from the state's resources and they have this in norway too mm -hmm. um so you would you would have a, a degree of of collective ownership, but you still have you know trade and and exchange. So mm -hmm. what I would do is I would say that capitalism, what socialists refer to by capitalism, is a system that is yes, it's an unregulated market, um, but it's also a concentration of ownership. Mm, okay, yeah, that's a great uh, definition there. Let me just. Okay, so flowing from that, you hear a lot of caricatures against yeah. socialism. I mean, Ooh, really, yeah. there are, there are caricatures against pretty much anything and everything. Sure. Uh, but a, a big one is that you'll hear that the Nazis were socialists. So how could you ever adopt yeah. such a system? You know, yeah, yeah. How would you address well, that? <laughs> I've written an article. I've written a full article on this. So I won't rehash everything in the article. But people should read the uh, the. Yeah. Nazis were socialist based. And I think I touch on it in the Why You Should Be a Socialist book. Yes. Um, but essentially, where I usually begin with this question is okay, well, you tell me 
what the Nazi agenda has in common with the Bernie Sanders platform, you know, (laughs) and the answer is nothing, right? You know, the Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders platform is like free healthcare, free college. And then to the extent that you could find commonalities at all with, uh, between what Hitler did in Germany in the 1930s and forties, um, and anything being advocated today, they wouldn't be any of the things that are the problem with right. Nazis. So the problem <laughs> with Nazis is that they're exterminationist racists, okay, who came to power try on, on the platform. And I've, I've written a review of uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf. Spoiler, I didn't like it very much. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I wrote an article about, about Mein Kampf and the, and, mm. the, and the agenda. And mm-hmm. you can see when you read the book very clearly that Mm -hmm. Hitler is on the right. So he might have appropriated the word socialist to gain popularity, Mm -hmm. right? Because it's like democracy, like uh, North Korea calls itself. I was just going to say that. Right. So, you know, everyone wants to brand themselves like the things that uh, that people will vote for because they go, ooh, social, ooh, democratic, ooh, republic. No, but you've got to look at what do they actually stand for? So, Mm -hmm. okay, you read you read Hitler's text and it's the whole thing is just (laughs) like, uh, you know, anti-Marxist. He detests communists and, and Marxists. He says very clearly what I mean by socialism has nothing to do with what, what the Marxists believe by, by socialism. It's like almost a direct quote. Yep. Um, and he just blames the Jews for everything. Okay, for everything. all right. Well, <laughs> so yeah. uh, when I look at what attracted people in our time to the agenda of a Jewish socialist in 2016 and 2020, um, it was things like, you know, decriminalize marijuana and um, <laughs> make sure that everyone has access to health care. And all that stuff. And so it just becomes ludicrous because you go like, okay, well, the reason people are horrified by Nazis is that they wanted to establish concentration camps to um, imprison and kill the people they saw as inferior races. Well, what socialists have always been is... You know, and obviously there was racial problems in the early socialist parties, but um, mm-hmm. but socialists in, in our time have always been anti-racist, um, yeah. and they've identified and they've identified racism as a misdiagnosis of social problems. That is to say, you're blaming a racial group where you should be pointing the finger at your boss. Right. That's socialists have never been, you know, uh, have always been pushing it back against the rights attempt to stigmatize ethnic and racial groups, um, religious minorities uh, for what we see as problems that are jo- largely created by the structure of the economic system. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. there's just nothing in common between socialism and, you know, the the right. bizarre, horrifying <laughs> ideology that Hitler called national socialism. Yeah. And if you don't even have this principle of equality uh, in mind at all, how can you be deemed a socialist in any way, shape or form? And you made right. a good point about um, Kim Jong Un's Democratic yeah. People's Republic of North Korea. <laughs> Of course, that has nothing if to do with democracy. Yeah, if we're going to defer to uh, the labels people apply to themselves, um, yeah, every dictator calls themselves uh, a Democrat, a Democratic, uh, and, a, and a Republican. Lowercase D, lowercase R, Democrat, <laughs> Democratic, Republican. You know, do we believe that that's the standard by which we should measure what democracy yeah. and republicanism are? Right, that's not a good metric to to measure right. such at all. Uh, you know, I think most of the time they're they're uh, you know latching on to these terms really to just fulfill their uh, immediate political purposes. Uh, you know, even Hitler said that he was a Christian. <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly he was not a Christian. Maybe he was religious in the sense of bringing back some kind of a uh, glorious epoch of the past or uh, this kind of uh mythical Aryan warrior god as he depicted Christ to be but i mean the the story of yeah. of of this all is that you can employ whatever terms you want but we really have to assess and dig into those terms to see if they actually mean what they mean yeah i feel yeah. like jesus was a little jewish for hitler's taste yeah 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 exactly right i would agree <laughs> and even take a place like uh venezuela you know uh they they're called socialist but you know they're rooted in right-wing authoritarian governance and uh, military kleptocracy. I mean, they cannot right. be said to truly be socialist. Well, I quoted. I think I quote in the "Why You Should Be a Socialist" book uh, a Venezuelan union leader talking about uh, you know the idea of Venezuelan socialism, what a what a crock it is, and mm-hmm. and I also quote the Wall Street Journal reporter who was down mm-hmm. there and said, you know, this isn't socialism. This is kleptocracy. This yes. is just yep. a a, a 
a corrupt state ruled by mm-hmm. elites who who like every other uh, band of ruling elites mm-hmm. claim to rule in the name of the people. And so there's a very strong incentive for a corrupt ruling elite to brand themselves socialists. In fact, I, I think uh, this is happening in Haiti right now is that warlords are um, branding themselves revolutionaries, right? And trying mm-hmm. to say that they're launching a people's revolution. Um, and they're just they're just they're just gang leaders. Um, yeah. But they realize that, you know, it might help them to obtain support to call themselves revolutionaries acting in the name of the people. Um, but, you know, you can't really judge populism by what bad yeah. actors do with the these kinds of labels. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, framing yourself as a populist, you know, a populist and uh, caring about the people is is a very it's a very potent thing to say and people can yeah. believe it <laughs> I mean, right but the, answer, the, the question yeah. is do you you yes. know are you committed to the stated principles and it's no judgment on the principles uh mm-hmm. to point if, if people don't act upon them but claim they are right they're right. hypocrites um yeah. and so you you have to judge and, and this is often thrown back at socialism oh you you always say that every socialist government is not real socialism and yeah, um, yeah. that that's that's a critique that is made but what what i yes. say to that is is no what i say is you evaluate a government on the basis of whether it is carrying through the principles that we believe in mm-hmm. okay and to the extent that it is carrying through the principles we believe in it, it is embodying those principles to the yeah. extent that it is not, we reject it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So we can, um, you know, so so we 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 could praise, um, for example, the uh, literacy campaign in Cuba after the Cuban Revolution as an embodiment of socialist principles, but we can say that authoritarianism, the the rejection of elections and democracy and free mm-hmm. speech doesn't embody the principles of solidarity and equality that mm-hmm. are foundational to socialism. So the mm-hmm. state is socialist to the extent that it is following socialist principles, principles. and not socialist to the extent yeah. that it is violating those principles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Okay, so it's often said that capitalism rewards innovation, whereas socialism breeds these kinds of lazy schmucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how would you assess that? that those statements well you know i I happened upon a couple of years ago an inter- very interesting lecture by peter Thiel at stanford that i think i quote in the socialism book where mm-hmm. uh you know peter Thiel, this this billionaire right-wing billionaire and he's talking about innovation under mm-hmm. capitalism and he says he gets a really interesting admission in the lecture and he says you know, people always say that the innovators get rewarded in the market system. Mm-hmm. And he's like, but they, that's not true. He goes, the innovators get nothing. You know, if you look at what the scientists who develop a new technology, you know, what they get usually, um, it's like scientists don't get rich in our society. Great point. Um, yeah. You know, programmers don't get rich. People who, you know, the people who create the important things that we need. He said the person who gets rich, uh, and, you know, he's kind of speaking to business school students. He, I mean, he thinks this is a good <laughs> thing. So he, he's like, uh, he's like, you get rich through a monopoly, right? And so you should become a monopolist. You, what you, The person who gets rich is the person who takes the innovation and figures out how to monetize it, how to, and how to put a barrier between people and what they need, like a toll gate. Mm-hmm. OK, so Peter Thiel, for instance, you know, gets rich off of PayPal. So he figures out that a great th- way to make money is to be a middleman. Mm. So one person has to send money to this other person. Uh, what if I'm the person in the middle that they have to go through and I can take a cut? Um, and, you know, he got he got very rich that way. Is he an innovator? Is he? Um, well, not really, because the thing that he made is very easy to make. Um, and if we had, you know, a if we had a state that just made, you know, payment plat- payment transfer really, really easy, um, we wouldn't have needed Peter Thiel um, mm-hmm. to do this. Um, and he made a ton of money and he said, you know, don't don't go out and try and like spend your life 
coming up with some wonderful innovation or invention. Mm -hmm. Just look for how can I be a conduit from money to one place to another. And I think he's I think he's kind of right. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the people who are the wealthiest in our society, usually they are people who have um I've, I've written an article about billionaire memoirs actually because they tell okay. you how they got rich. It's mm -hmm. really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um they're people like um uh, Richard Branson, uh, Sam Zell, who was a billionaire, and I read all their memoirs, and, and it was totally fascinating because most of them had never invented anything. Um, you know, Richard Branson, you know, he would start a record label, but he was like the gatekeeper for artists, right? And he wouldn't, he didn't record music, he didn't have any talent. Um, he, uh, and, and Sam Zell was like a real estate guy who just bought up, uh, properties and realized that as a landlord you can make a ton of money mm -hmm. so if you look at the way that people actually make money in the society the yeah. people who do the wonderful inventions the really incredible things they rarely become the richest people mm -hmm. and the other thing is they're not out for riches the people who innovate always if you ask them they say i'm not in it for for money i'm in it for the joy of creating something and, and giving it to humankind sure. Sure. And so if yeah. we think well what system best causes innovation to flourish i think it is a system where people's basic needs are met so that they are able to think and explore and create and they don't have to worry about um so for example Okay, is it is are people going to be more innovative or less innovative if going to college costs an absolute fortune and gets you into a big pile of debt? Mm -hmm. I think personally that we should be giving education for free Perfect. because if you educate yeah. people, if you say, look, education is totally free, then people can spend their time thinking about, you know, using that knowledge to create rather than having to think, yeah. how do yeah, I yeah. pay for this, which takes up an awful lot of your brain space. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Also, too, passive income. I think you mentioned about yeah. Sean Hannity. I believe it was in Why You Should. Yeah, be he has a bunch of properties. Yeah, yeah these apartment complexes. You know, he he owns them. But if you were to ask him, "Hey, Sean, where are they?" He probably has no. I am clue certain he doesn't know where they are. Where they are. I'm but certain he, he doesn't know where they money are. His money makes money. It's the most so, money making money. Yeah, yeah, it's money making. I mean, so yeah. he's making money while he's asleep. So what is he? What is he? In, what is he contributing? What is he contributing? There's no labor. He's there. contributing nothing. He just happened mm -hmm. to have money. He mm -hmm. used that money to buy properties, and the properties. If he doesn't manage the properties, he has a the company that manages the property, and they just send him money. Now right. you can defend that right on a property rights theory, which is mm -hmm. that you say, well, look, it's his right with to do what he wants with that money and yeah. make, and to and to make money with that money but what you can't argue i think is that he is contributing anything yeah yeah no i would agree that makes sense yeah also too if you could touch upon how marx and engels respected the productive power of capitalism oh yeah you know it's always kind of Whenever you hear Marx and Engels, there's this immediate, uninterrupted intuition that, you know, they absolutely loathed it and didn't see any kind of merit in it at all. Yeah, this is a very yeah. interesting point, too, because yeah, yeah. even though I, I in the previous answer, I said that, you know, uh, I don't think that the people who do most of the innovating make most of the money. Yeah. Uh, it's also true that the people who work the hardest don't make most of the money. In fact, the people who work the hardest get uh, low wages. But um, workers. right, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it doesn't reward innovation. It doesn't reward hard work. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Marx, th th this is a really interesting and another real serious misunderstanding because it's often said that. Um, social as a case against socialism we'll look at all the innovation produced under capitalism look at all look at how productive it is look at the grocery store filled with all the wonderful things mm -hmm. um you know or go and look at a cap go and look at a grocery store in the united states and see all of these incredible things that you can buy um and so it is in fact true that the capitalist system has created this abundance this incredible productivity. Yeah. And also, that is discussed extensively in the Communist Manifesto. Marx and Engels saw this. They said that capitalism 
produces this, it, you know, it's revolutionary. It produces these incredible range of things. It massively increases the productive power of mm -hmm. society. But what they argued was that it is also a highly unstable system, that this division of classes inherently leads to disastrous conflict, that this system is going to, at some point, um, implode. Um, now, whether or not it is actually, whether Mar Mar Marx's historical predictions are true, I don't think they are true. I don't mm. think it is necessarily true that capitalism will Im implode because of its own internal contradictions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but the important thing is that they didn't see, uh, they weren't arguing that capitalism doesn't produce an abundance of consumer goods. Yeah. What they were saying essentially was that's one phase of the economic development of society. What we need to do is we need to develop those productive powers through capitalism. Mm -hmm. But capitalism is a stage, stage that yeah. we pass through. And then what we need to do is we need to equalize ownership so that we can all reap the benefits of what has happened in the capitalist stage. Uh, so increasing production. So it is not really an argument against socialism to say that so a socialist society would innovate less, because even if it's true, you could say, well, yes, but we've developed the ability to provide for all under capitalism. And now we can slow down and we can share the benefits of what we have developed in this in this stage and we can yeah, move to yeah. the next the next stage. Right. And, and so it's a necessary stage. Marx would be arguing. That's in the Marxist theory. It's yeah, a necessary in the Marxist theory. That you have to pass yeah. through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now he believes it will eventually culminate into socialism and then communism. I mean, is that really, yeah. that's the end of his economic vision? That's right. Okay. Okay. Do, do you think that's what will happen? Do you, do you I, see that? I, I, I think it, I, I don't, I don't, you know, Marx was a prophet, right? Predicting yeah. the future. Pre right, right. I, I never, I try not to predict the future. Makes sense. Because I think that's yeah. beyond my capacities. Mm -hmm. I just make arguments for things that I think ought to happen and try and encourage them, people to work to make them happen. But I, I don't share the Marxist view that you can, that the, and, and, and Marx is very on this, but it, but it is a strand within Marxism that says essentially like the laws of economics operate kind of like the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. And we can tell that this is going to happen because it's kind of baked into to capitalism. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it would be hard to predict that in any meaningful sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... The next question, is the government the problem? Should we have more or less government? And we kind of talked about government a little bit, but again, yeah. a real strong, uh, well, I don't want to say strong, but <laughs> a criticism against socialism is really that it's it, it's all about the government. The government, it, we, we shouldn't trust the government. You know, let's yeah. stay away. Well, let's limit government as much yeah. as we can. I, I One of the things I, I try to break people out of is this idea of government as, as one thing that you can talk about as there's more or less of it um because let's when you think intelligently um and break down the abstraction known as government into its component parts you know the post office is a part of government mm -hmm. garbage collectors are a part of government um the people outside right now out my window repairing a pothole are part of government right and the uh, police are part of government and prisons Our and the services. army and the social security administration and uh, the uh, the FAA mm -hmm. uh, is a part of government and the highways are a part of government and, you, you know, so uh, me Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. So how could you possibly have a view on more or less of all of this? Right. <laughs> uh, uh, you have to you have to break it down. And you have to say, what do we what do we want government to do? And what do we want it to do more of? And what do we want it to do less of? And OK. And my um, Ben Burgess, who uh, writes for Current Affairs yeah. sometimes, has a good way of talking about this, where he says, you know, we can 
we can think roughly of things that the government does to you and things that the government does for you. Yes. And we like the things that the government does for you. Um, We like it when they send your social security check. Um, We like it when they build and maintain your roads. Um, Is that big government? Is Mm -hmm. is the highway administration big government if there are Mm -hmm. a lot of highways? Um, I don't think people (laughs) talk about it that way or think about it. No, no, they don't. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the places where we want to restrain government power are when government's doing things to you, the police and prisons and mm-hmm. when, you know, and, and going after people's speech and going after things that don't harm anyone, like using drugs in your own home. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and obviously, uh, I, as a kind of libertarian socialist, uh, are suspicious of bureaucracy and regulation. Um, you know, I believe that large companies' misbehavior should be regulated, but I don't believe that everyone should have to fill out a bunch of forms in order to do, to do a simple thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I think an intelligent person doesn't discuss, you know, do we want big or small government? <laughs> they say, yeah. like, what, how big does the does a particular government agency have to be in order to carry through the functions that we want it to carry out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, again, just a lot of caricatures, a lot of talking points. Um, Yeah. You know, you make a good point in responding to the right. I think you brought up how Ronald Reagan said the worst words you can hear are I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. And then you, you said, if your house is on fire, those are the best words you'll ever yeah, hear. Yeah, right. <laughs> in the fire, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you really also, have to break these if things you're down. Lost yeah. in a national park, uh, you know. <laughs> I didn't think of that one. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Are you going to pull the Ronald Reagan thing and go? I, I, I'm sorry, but I, uh, I don't want Stay someone from the, from the government helping me. Right. You go. Right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just, and in fact, you know, I, I am fairly critical of the police, but a lot of people when they call nine one one. They want someone from the government to mm-hmm. come and help, mm-hmm. um, and so you you believe that uh, that you clearly don't believe. No one believes what Reagan said in a literal no. manner. They no. want certain government services. So then, as yes. I say, we got to break it down, and we say, well, what are the things that we want government? to do for us? I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I when when there's a disaster. I want government to come and fix it, right? Yeah. When they, you know, when there's a fire hydrant spewing everywhere, or when there's a, a a power line down, or when there's garbage filling the streets, I want someone to show up and say, "I'm from the government." Say precisely the thing that Reagan <laughs> said that you don't want people. That to you don't want, so yeah. you know, I just find that I find that talking point. You know, it's so it's so it, catchy, but it's so obnoxiously. It fun. is. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's a good point that. Ben made that distinction, you know, between what the government can do to you and what the government yeah. can do for you. I think that's really crucial. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next question, we're talking about government a lot, but do you trust the government? Do you trust the government? Well, I mean, again, I would I would resist talking about it as a unitary mm-hmm. A, a you know one with this sort of abstract blob called government yeah. um i trust the social security administration to send out social security checks cuz i think they they're pretty good at it i also think however that any bureaucracy if it doesn't have accountability mm-hmm. um is going to break down um so like or we take the the post office for instance um do i trust the post office to deliver the mail well i yeah i do but yeah. also do i think the post office um without being you know held accountable can deliver the mail very badly uh, i do because i'm in the yeah. publishing industry and they lose our magazines all the time um <laughs> so i uh you know do i trust for example the uh the faa uh, yeah, I do, because there hasn't been a, a a fatality on a domestic flight in 15 years, uh, I think. It, it's yeah. like got an incredible record at this point right. of, of uh, flight safety. And um, however, there's been these news reports recently about uh, the air traffic controllers being tired and overworked and understaffed. So do I trust that they're going to keep the planes 
uh, that that safety record is going to continue if the uh, there aren't reforms. No, I don't trust. Mm-hmm. So it's like, again, I, I would encourage us to stop thinking in generic statements about government and start breaking down, you know, well, what are, do I trust the CIA and the FBI? Well, not very much because they're, they, they're agencies that don't have much external oversight. Or democratic and accountability. given a lot of power without much mm. transparency. And mm. I don't trust agencies that have a ton of power without much transparency. Mm. Um, but, you know, but other parts of government, I, I think are different. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. Yeah. Really, yes or no. Right, right. I think that was a good response. Okay, so some argue that democracy is overrated and that it should be replaced with, say, an epistocracy. Uh, why would you think mm. this is a problem? Now, I think his name is Jason Brennan. Jason Brennan. The contemporary yeah, libertarian. Theory. Yeah, that it should be yeah, yeah. democracy should be replaced with an epistocracy. And for those who don't know, an epistocracy is uh, a system of government where the intellectual elite rule and you know whoever would be the intellectual elite. I'm not sure how we'd even arrive at such. Well, that's, I mean, you, you've you already given essentially a, an important part of the answer to the question, mm-hmm. which is, um, you know, Brennan lays out all these reasons why the people, the people can't be trusted uh, to, to in, in a democracy, right? They make all these bad choices. And, you know, I really do think that that, that classic Churchill quote about like democracy is the worst system except for all the others, it's actually very profound because... Mm-hmm. You think, okay, yeah, you can point to all these flaws in democracy, but you, in order to actually argue that we ought to replace it, you you have to argue that there is another system that not just in theory, but in practice can produce better results. And when you start to think, well, how, and yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we had omniscient philosopher kings who knew all of our best interests better than we could, we would, didn't have to do anything because they would just rule the society perfectly and and much much better than we ever could and we could just relax we wouldn't have to vote in elections we <laughs> we just know that everything was being taken care of mm-hmm. um yeah that'd be great um if the, if those people existed um in practice those people don't exist and that's i mean brennan's a philosopher he's not yeah. a uh, political scientist so he's conjuring this sort of ab- this uh, wonderful hypothetical and you could tell a story about these great epistocrats who rule benevolently over society. I mean, mm-hmm. I would just argue that in practice, any attempt to do what he advocates doing, that is limiting the vote, um, would be a disaster because it would result in, I mean, everyone thinks that they should be the epistocrat, right? Is there anyone who thinks exactly. that they're yeah. wrong about politics? Mm-hmm. No, everyone thinks they're right and everyone else is wrong. So there'd just be a war to try and disenfranchise the people you think are stupid. But how do you objectively decide who the epistocrats are? I mean, Brennan has his idea of who the epistocrats are, and it's people who believe in free market capitalism and and, uh, and libertarianism. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. but I disagree because I think that those systems are flawed. So my idea of the epistocrats is all the, all the Bernie Sanders people. Okay, so how are we going to resolve this objectively? And and the answer is we we don't have an answer. And so, you know, I, I when you started to think about how his system would be implemented, it, is it like okay, in order to vote, you have to take a test, and if you don't agree with Milton Friedman, you flunk the test <laughs> and you don't get to vote. Yeah, um, right. He right. also ignores something that I think is profoundly disturbing when you work it out, which is okay. Well, in practice, the poorest people are the least well-educated. Yeah. So aren't you going to have a system where the rich rule, if you have like an education test for voting, um, aren't you going to have a system where the the poorest people, where people who have low literacy, people who are uh, disabled, don't, or people who had, just haven't had a- access to great schooling, they're all going to be disenfranchised. And the people who you know are wealthy and they went to private school and they read Plato and all that, um, they all pass their voting test and they all get to they all get to vote. Mm-hmm. And I think that profoundly conflicts with some of our basic moral intuitions about vo- about voting as a universal human right. That is, yeah. you have a right to participate in the decision over what the government 
uh, should be. The, mm -hmm. the other point that I make about this is that it's it's deeply authoritarian because there's Certainly. a lot of people who advocate like voting tests and that sort of thing. And you think, well, OK, but what you're saying when you believe in a voting test is the government. Let's just go back to the government. <laughs> but this is a case in which the government in the gets to decide who gets to decide what the government should be. That is to say, instead of what is called the consent of the governed, that is, it is uh, the, the shape and co uh, of the government and the people who are in it, that's decided by the people who are ruled over by it. <laughs> instead, the people who rule over, they decide whether the populace and gets to participate and to what degree. And so it's a reversal of the relationship of the governed to the government, where a, a Democrat believes that the governed have the right to throw out their government, whereas the epistocrat believes that the government has a right to tell the populace, no, we're going to tell you what to do. And you don't get to you don't get to say because we've decided that you're not among those who are worthy enough to participate in decision making. You've been excluded. Yeah, that strikes me as very authoritarian, like you said. Yeah, totally, totally antithetical to not libertarian. It's and it's, yeah, and yeah. it's just libertarian, it's right? Crazy. Right. And you know, Nathan, you mentioned the CIA earlier. Think about the CIA for a moment as an agency that doesn't have that democratic accountability at all. You know, look yeah. at their um, overthrowing of you know foreign democracies, uh, you know, or the subversion of democracies, or even I think I was reading an article by you or Noam Chomsky, and you were talking about how. Um, you know, just the CIA torturing certain persons. I believe it was you who said that. I don't remember though. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, the... they've got a lot of they've got a really heinous record. Right. Um, uh, a lot of which hasn't even come to light because they're so unaccountable that they can that's what they, I mean. Yeah. Conceal their own records and and classify them. And we don't know till decades later what they've actually done. I mean, there are plenty of cases where we still don't know. The extent of their involvement in things that we kind exactly. of suspect they were involved in yeah so if we had a government functioning under an epistocracy i could see very similar things happening it, it no kinds worse. of yeah democratic accountability at all they'd tell you nothing you right. would you would have mm -hmm. no idea what your government was doing because mm -hmm. they don't feel any need to tell you about it yeah. um you would have no way of throwing them out if they what happens if the epistocrats get corrupt you mm -hmm. think that's never going to happen? You know, mm -hmm. what do you do to get rid of them? Do you just have to stage a revolution? Right. Because you can't vote them out because they prohibited you from voting because they said you weren't smart enough. It's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. And Brennan's book doesn't answer these questions at all. Um, I mean, I read it and it's just deeply unsatisfying in these respects. Mm -hmm. OK, so the next question is, is immigration harmful? Well, I, I think the experience of the United States would suggest that it isn't in that, you know, the cities that we have that are the most heavily populated by immigrants, like Los Angeles and New York, um, have been enriched by their immigrants since their founding, um, you know, for immigrants from all over. You know, you take a place like New York City and, you know, you ask, is immigration harmful? And you think, you know. My God, everyone there is an immigrant from some generation. Uh, it is a vast, uh, you know, it's a vast city of immigrants. How could it possibly be harmful? Um, immigrants to the United States, uh, generally, they build the economy because they come here to do work. Um, they are basically, it's, it's so weird to me. I've been writing recently about how there's all these complaints about the low birth rate. And it's like, oh, what are we going to do at the low birth rate? And it's like, well, you know what the solution for that is? Immigrants. You yeah, want more people. Yeah. If you're worried about your population <laughs> be getting small. It's a good point. Like, there's all these people who want to come and live in your society and work in it. And you don't even have to get the birth rate up because right. you've got all these people clamoring to come and be part of your society. Mm -hmm. Um and what you find over time, the, the argument about immigration is that immigrants don't assimilate. Um, but in fact, they assimilate a lot more than mm -hmm. the first generation of immigrants would prefer. Because yeah. when people move here and they don't speak the language, their children often grow up not speaking their native tongue. They just yeah. speak English. 
I and, remember they, they, and sometimes too. they can't even communicate with their parents because they're so bad at speaking the language from back home. I mean, <laughs> what we've seen over the course of all of American history um, is that this is precisely what happens to the point where all of the immigrants who come here and in the first generation, it's like, oh, my God, look at these people. They're so different from us. And it used to be, of course, as we know, the Italians and the Irish. You look, look at these Italians. And Germans. These Italians, and, yeah. You know, yeah. and uh well, you're in New, New Jersey, you know, yeah. a city built by its Italian immigrants. And it's yeah. like, like now it just sounds so ridiculous when you mm -hmm. look back at like the anti-Italian propaganda. And, and now it's like, it, it's so assimilated that it's not Italian-American. It's like, like often like not even that distinctive of, a, of an right. identity. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this and there just are... happens over and over. Yeah, and I mean, there are all kinds of vicious stereotypes, as you talk about in the book, you know, launched against anyone who is different from us, whether it be the Irish, Germans, Italians, yeah. uh, you know, they're always met with these vicious stereotypes, really, the, this otherization of other persons yeah. that are different, very, very tribal. The, the crazy thing is that people are so similar. Yeah. People are really so similar, ultimately. Right. Right. Um, I mean, people are different, but they're usually not different it's usually not the groups that are different. It's usually the individuals that yeah. are, are are different. True, yeah. And I mean, all the economic data I've ever read shows that immigrants are good for an economy. You know, they use their salaries to purchase goods and services, which creates the demand for more goods and services, which creates yeah. the demand for jobs. And you made a good point in, um, I think it was responding to the right, it might have been why you should be a socialist, but they essentially have the same effect on the economy as newborn babies. Yeah, well, just, that's what I say, with the birth rate. Yeah. The birth rate, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you want yeah. more people. More people bro grow your economy. They do work yes. to grow your economy. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, there may be instances in which immigrants move to a place and, you know, there's more competition for jobs in that place because there's more people, uh, supply mm -hmm. and demand, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, but on the whole, like, having more people in your country um, produces growth. Yeah. Um, one more thing about the immigrants, too, that just came to my mind. You'll often hear, you know, oh, they're taking all of our jobs uh, or, or they don't even pay any taxes at all. You know, they need to get out of here. <laughs> how, how would you respond to that? Well, I mean, I think I, as I understand, it's just false um, yep. because if you're undocumented, you're not eligible for uh, benefits, mm -hmm. but you pay taxes. Yes. Um, so everyone pays the taxes they, they have to pay. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of a lot of immigrants actually get a pretty rough deal um, mm -hmm. because they pay in for benefits that they'll never get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. OK, um, what what is the best case for universal health care? You know, again, um, pretty broad. question. Well, but... yeah, I mean, yeah. the best case is that your society is way better off if you just make sure people aren't sick. Um Makes so sense. like you know if you take care of people you know they you, your society will function if you have all these sick people who can't afford then they're infecting other people they can't do jobs they can't raise families um it's the, it's just it's a dysfunctional society if everyone's yeah. sick so you know you have an interest everyone has an interest in just making sure that everyone is given good care and uh so and it's the and there are other parts to it, right? Which is like on a moral level, I think people mm -hmm. have a right. I think it's it's something we owe each other to try and make sure each other stays alive and healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that it's affordable, and we know it can be done because there are plenty of countries that that do it, and yeah. it works quite well. Um, I'm from Britain originally. National Health Service is underfunded, which is a shame, but it's still very popular in Britain because um it it works because you you can and it's actually more affordable for the state to take care of it because of e economies of scale and such than it is to have this patchwork of private insurance systems and private providers that we have here the crazy thing about the u.s healthcare system is like if you hate bureaucracy you should really hate our system of like private providers and private health insurers and the marketplace system yeah you're filling out forms all the time. I just had my health insurance canceled and I got to now find new health insurance. And it's like, you, you could just avoid all of these headaches with a, with a universal system. 
Yeah. And I, I watched the debate between Charlie Kirk and Ben Burgess. Did you happen to see that? Oh, yeah, that was good. Yeah. But it was very good. I watched a lot of it. Yeah. But Charlie made a point that, um, you know, uh, universalizing healthcare would be very bureaucratic. It would be even more bureaucratic than it is now. And Ben said, well, no, it would actually it's the exact yeah, opposite. Wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's completely wrong. Okay, let me see here. What okay, so what is the value of freedom of speech and why is it so important? Well, it's kind of like the what we said about the epistocracy thing, which yeah. is that uh it's valuable because the alternative is so horrifying, right? Mm -hmm. Which is okay, when you start to empower some authority to decide what the permissible speech is they're usually going to conclude that the speech they don't like is the speech that is harmful, yes, uh, yeah. whether or not that's true. So so the profound danger of empowering any institution or person to be the judge is the reason why freedom of speech is so important. Mm -hmm. um, it just It's just really, really dangerous to put anyone in charge of deciding what the permissible thoughts are yeah. um, and the permissible speech is. Mm -hmm. um, and this is often, I think, missed because people think the case against free speech is, well, look at the way this speech does terrible harm. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I can agree with you that that speech does terrible harm. I can agree with you that it would be nice if we banned that speech. But what we're talking about is, again, taking it from like theory land uh like like people like brennan live in and talking about the real world well how are you going to construct an institution that reliably identifies only the speech that really is valueless and really does harm mm -hmm. and and it's not going to be just a popularity contest that excludes dissident voices i happen to be a leftist and a socialist i am in that respect, a dissident voice. Mm -hmm. And I fear um, being, I fear any attempts to regulate political speech because yeah. I know that historically in the United States, leftists and socialists have been considered beyond the pale. And so when Facebook says, oh, we're going to get rid of unreliable news sources from our platform. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean just right? Right-wing unreliable sources, or are they going to deem current affairs to be fringe yeah, and yeah. get kicked off because they've decided that the only permissible speech is the New York Times? Um, so I would much prefer that both Prager University and current affairs are allowed on a platform mm -hmm. than just the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if the, and if that means letting Prager University on, on a platform, so be it, even though I think Prager University spreads lies and propaganda. Right, right. Yeah. And I think uh, Noam Chomsky said it, but, you know, in order to really be a proponent of freedom of speech, you have to tolerate speech that you hate or you're not a everyone, proponent. Everyone is speech. in favor of free speech. Stalin was in favor of free speech. I was speech just going liked. to say that. Yeah, that yeah. he liked, the speech he, that he, he liked. He's all for pro-Stalin mm -hmm. speech, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, in, in the end, I think compelling or appropriating patterns of speech is is quite dangerous and can open up a whole door for you know, yeah. really appropriating whatever the hell you want. Yeah. Okay, so what is the difference between positive liberty and negative liberty, and which is more important? Well, we discussed this a little bit in the uh, in the two you and four you distinction about government, which yes. is to say, you know, this this conception is usually like the negative liberty is is restraint from interfering with you, and positive liberty is when you know, you are given a new capacity to do something mm -hmm. um, like, you know, education, a free education can be said to to give you positive freedom because mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, you're able to do things with that education that you weren't able to do before. And that increase in your capacity yeah. is a kind of increase in your freedom. Whereas if I just don't put you in jail uh, for reading a book, <laughs> that would be uh, that would be an example of of negative liberty. I'm not helping you in any way, but I am just refraining from interfering with you. And I think in practice, yeah. these these are not you can't put everything into one one or the other. I think uh, 
uh, it's been a while since I thought about this, but uh, I, I think there are things that are sort of, it's not clear which which one or the other that they are, uh, which is more important. Um, again, you know, you can't, you can't really answer that definitively. There are lots of things that, I mean, it's just necessary to have both kinds. It's both necessary kinds. to have the state refrain from interfering with people, uh, uh, interfering with people's basic right to do things that should they should be free to do. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. But it's also important for the state not just to do that, but to try and increase people's capacity to meaningfully act because uh, if you, for example you're totally free to do whatever you want but you can't afford to eat so mm -hmm. all you're going to do is starve to death um you're not very free in a meaningful sense yeah so you know they should give you food to increase your positive liberty right yeah and even within just the subjective sense of the self that question of what is freedom a lot of people think freedom is just choosing from this cascade of uh things but I, on my view freedom you know, when choices start to vanish, you you are more free. You, you're more in accord yeah. with the good. Uh, I, because I think we're a culture that sees choice itself as the good, not in fact what we are choosing. I think yeah. it's an important distinction. Yep. Okay, so I know we're jumping around here, but these are great questions. <laughs> Why are labor unions a good thing? Now, I know you i forget when it happened but the guardian you were fired from the guardian for making yeah. a comment about a tweet uh, a u.s funding israel i believe uh, it was a so. joke about okay the US. Uh, <laughs> i i just said like they passed some i forget think it was covid relief bill and attached some military aid to israel or something and i yeah. said you know did you know it's the law that every time the u.s congress passes any law it has to throw in some weapons for israel and then i said by the way this is a joke but they fired me anyway um, wow, yeah. If I had a union, because uh, I was a freelancer, technically, I was a columnist, but I was freelance. Um, uh, the full time staff, they have a union. And so they wouldn't have been able to fire me if I had a union. So yeah. one reason uh, that labor unions are good is because they protect people from mm -hmm. unjust firing by their employers. And they give mm -hmm. you some of that negative liberty at mm -hmm. work which is to say you can you can do some things that you should be allowed to do uh without the arbitrary whim of your of your boss uh punishing you for it so yeah. you know for any given work i mean i weirdly interestingly enough you see this acknowledged by conservatives even though they usually argue that labor unions are like a drag on the economy yeah they I have argue, heard that criticism. and i have some quotes in the book from right-wing sources that go but yeah, of course, labor unions are good for the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. you go, wait a second, wait a second. That's a pretty big admission. Labor unions are good for the people who are made. I mean, you've just admitted that the set, from a rational self-interest perspective, everyone should be in a union. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, OK, there are these there are these macro effects. But at your workplace, if you unionize, you will be better off. Um, and that's something that both people who are critical of unions and people who are pro-union actually admit. I mean, yeah, they go, oh, well, you have to pay dues. But we know that on average, the dues are more than compensated for by the advantages that you get from collective bargaining. That is, the union uses your mm -hmm. dues to pay staff and those staff fight for you and they negotiate a contract for you that's actually going to give you back way more Mm -hmm. then you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and and we just know that union jobs pay better. Everyone wants a union job. Yeah, if you have a choice between a union job and a non-union uh, job, you take the union job. And the reason you take the union job is because you have a, an organization that is specifically looking out for you. You get paid better. You get, uh, as I say, you're protected from unjust firing. Mm -hmm. You're protected from being, you know, arbitrarily forced to work a schedule you didn't uh, agree to. Um, a union job is just a better job. So you should be in a union. It's mm -hmm. pretty simple. Yeah, it's just far more democratic. Lots of democratic accountability there. And I mean, even think of Amazon workers uh, having to skip bathroom breaks. You yeah. know, if they had a union, and, you know, there would be more democratic well, accountability, able to why, negotiate yeah. better working why conditions. Why doesn't Amazon want them to have a union? Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good question. Because they couldn't order them about in the same way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, why is Amazon fighting them so hard? Uh, you know.
Um, yeah. Okay, so where do you see the future of American politics heading? I know we talked about earlier, you know, trying to predict the future, but I try, yeah, just, I try not yeah, to try, try to avoid uh, it. Yeah. Say that. I mean, you will, we can talk about how we're in a very troubling moment because uh, I obviously, at the moment, it looks like Donald Trump is going to return to office, right? The polling mm. suggests mm -hmm. at the moment that Donald Trump will win this year. Um, it could turn around, um, but unless it turns around, if the election were held today, he would be the favorite to win. That's a catastrophe, uh, in my opinion, because um, I think one of the most urgent issues of our time is climate change. And obviously, Trump's policy is like, uh, burn the planet. Um, that concerns me deeply. Um, he's also very authoritarian. They also have a lot of plans that they want to put in place to make sure they never lose an election again. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there could be a, a big showdown between this radical authoritarian movement and the majority of the country who I think rejects it. Mm -hmm. But the Democratic Party has been so weak. Biden is very weak um, but, and, and very unpopular. And so people don't feel like they have an alternative. Um, and so it's, I mean, I see a future of deep conflict between a hard right authoritarian movement and a public that does not accept the values of that movement mm -hmm. but also does not but also the the existing party infrastructure on the other side is pretty weak and not very inspiring um mm -hmm. i i'm concerned about the future definitely i actually wrote my thesis on democratic backsliding in hungary ah. And I see a lot of parallels between Orban and Trump, for sure. Yeah, oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, so this is actually the last question here. What would your book recommendations be, besides your own? <laughs> yeah, well, besides, you should yeah. pick up Boys Be Socialists, yeah. Respond to the Right, and you should pre-order uh, Myth of American Idealism uh, with Chomsky. Um, I have a... a uh, uh, an article that I did in 2017 called Literature of the Left, which I was just put to you in the chat oh but, cool uh, okay uh that article and someone made a goodreads uh list of all the things that i recommended that that that, that has my all of the stuff that inspired me uh from george orwell to emma goldman to mm -hmm. angela davis and you know, chomsky who i've probably read more of than i've read of anyone else mm -hmm. best word place to start with him other than the book we've done together is a book called understanding power which is very good um, as I say, I really liked George Orwell. Um, I, I never liked 1984 and Animal Farm that much, but I really loved the essays and um, Catalonia and uh, Down and Out in Paris and London. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of molded me uh, as a as a socialist. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of books that I've I've made a list of, and oh, and also in uh, Why You Should Be a Socialist, I have. And, and responding to the right, I have book recommendations. I think so. Why is right, so there's, there's a bunch in the bibliography, yeah. and there's also a place called a uh, there's also a thing called a left media diet, um, right at the end that has not just books but also podcasts and YouTube channels that I think are, are really great. Mm -hmm. And then responding to the right at the end of each section, I have uh, additional reading that fleshes out the arguments on particular topics that I've covered. Yeah. Have you read uh, Cohen's Why You Should Be a Socialist, that little book? He talks about the camping trip. G.A. Um, Cohen. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, the, uh, the, yeah, his, yeah. Uh, no, I think it's I called Why, uh, what is it? Oh, Why Socialism. Why Socialism. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, the camping yeah. trip. I think that's a real good way, an introductory way to think about socialist ideas. Yeah, Cohen's, Cohen's yeah. thing is very cool. Cohen's, uh, he's got some good lectures on YouTube, too, that people should watch. G.A. Cohen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then ben, ben Burgess has actually written about him a lot. He's a big, big GA Cohen fan. Yes. Yeah, Ben is for sure. Um, last question just came to mind. Who are some of your heroes? Philosophers, political well, I try philosophers? Not to have heroes. Because I, mean, yeah. uh, I just think it's a bad idea because then you discover some terrible thing about them and you're like, <laughs> ah, shit. Every, yeah. Everyone's <laughs> Everything's sucks. destroyed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, there are there are lots of people that I admire. Um you know, I was just, but I was just putting in the, um, 
I was just actually working on the part of the Chomsky book where we quote Howard Zinn talking about how you know social movements succeed because of people whose people whose names you don't know and who did mm. the work behind the scenes. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you could point to someone like Martin Luther King and you could say, well, he's very admirable and I love his I, I really like his writing on socialism and uh, he was more radical than people give him credit for. And so, you know, Martin Luther King's a big, uh, you know, big inspiration. But at the same time, obviously, the civil rights movement is built by tens and tens of thousands of people, most of whose names don't enter the history books. And so I think my heroes tend to be people who work all their lives to push a movement forward and then don't get any credit for it. Yeah. Right. So the people who built the National Health Service in Britain, there's like the Socialist Medical Association, you know, they built that. It didn't come about. You had to fight for it. And, you know, there's the guy who was the uh, health minister in the socialist government that sort of brought it through, who I've written about, um, Bevan. But, uh, there's also all the people who like spent decades trying to get a universal healthcare system and you don't know who any of them are, but mm -hmm. those are, those people are, are, are heroes to me. The people, mm -hmm. the people who just people you don't working know all yeah. the time, all their yeah. lives. And they just died without ever seeing this thing come to fruition. Comes to fruition. Yeah. That's a good, great, great response. When will the Chomsky book be coming out? Uh, October. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's coming out in October. All right, so not not that long of a wait. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe I'll pre-order it after we conclude. Yeah, have to I, here. <laughs> I, it's it's a, it's good too. I I, bet. I, I, I bet. was I've just been looking over the manuscript because the final final edits to do on uh, Monday, like the last 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 edit. It's been a very long process. We've been writing this thing for years. Um, oh wow. Okay. And uh, and it's it's damn good. I'm proud of it. Looking forward to it. Well, Nathan, thank you very much for wow, your time. It's been and... a great pleasure, Eric. Really, yeah. really uh, like those, like the questions, uh, like chatting with you. All the best to you. Yeah, you too, Nathan. Maybe we could do it again soon. Hope so. All right, man. All right. Take care. I'll see you. Bye bye.